Good evening, and welcome to the interactive grimoire. Tonight's question, what is alchemy? The term alchemy comes from the Arabic alchem, which in turn is said to come from the Egyptian chem, meaning black, and referring to the Egyptians' own name for their country, Kemet, the black land. Thus the term alchemy is the origin of the term black art, though the meaning is very different than that later ascribed to this phrase. However, others say that the word comes from the Greek kimi. Considering that the Egyptians and the Greeks were in close contact for hundreds of years, and that the Greeks in fact ruled Egypt through the Ptolemaic dynasty for 300 years, and that each seriously influenced the culture of the other, the term could very well be a play on both words. The Hellenistic era, and Hellenistic Egypt in particular, was a very fertile time in the history of magic. Ancient forms of magic met and merged, creating new disciplines. Magical forms still very much in use today, such as Hermeticism and Alchemy, have their origin in Hellenistic Egypt. Most people have a very mistaken view of what alchemy is, based largely upon the caricatures of its enemies and the misunderstandings of the uninformed. The image of the alchemist as benighted protochemist vainly bent on turning lead into gold, totally misses the point of alchemical thought. It is true the Western alchemists, like their Chinese counterparts, did work with a variety of substances to try and create various elixirs and arcane effects, including the idea of transmutation of base metals. However, this was a small aspect of alchemy, and to define alchemy by this is like defining Taoism as the search for the elixir of immortality it misses the real point altogether. In reality, alchemy was and is an advanced spiritual discipline, closely related to modern Wicca in its concepts and images. These concepts and images were presented in largely coded form so that they could be read by the unenlightened as relating to chemistry and physical operations, and by the enlightened as a system of spiritual wisdom. Thus, the true alchemist was not trying to turn ordinary lead into gold, though the casual observer might reasonably think so from how things were presented. Rather, they were striving to turn the lead of an ordinary and undeveloped consciousness into the gold of a fully realized and enlightened soul. Like modern Wicca, alchemy saw the world as a male-female duality. Alchemical ideas about this duality are strikingly similar to Wiccan ideas about goddess and god. The masculine polarity was thought of as red and fixed the feminine polarity as white and volatile. The union of these two produced the physical world. The great work, or alchemical marriage, was the quest to unite and transcend this duality. It is the great work which is often mistakenly described as the quest to transmute base metals. The great work began with what is termed materia prima. This is the ordinary state of being, the lead in the analogy. The great work ended in the creation of the Philosopher's Stone. This is enlightenment, or the gold of the analogy. The materia prima was considered to have both a masculine and a feminine aspect, which were in opposition within it until brought into alignment through the great work, hence the term alchemical marriage. The great work has three main parts, the nigredo, the albedo, and finally the rubedo. These correspond to the sacred colors of the Wiccan goddess, black, white, and red. In addition, a fourth stage, called the cauda pavonis, marked the transition between nigredo and albedo. Symbolically, the materia prima was placed into an athenor, or alchemical furnace, which subjected it to steady pressure and reduced it to its constituent parts. This residue was the nigredo, the destruction of preconceived forms considered necessary for new growth to occur. What this really means is that before one can grow spiritually, one must first eliminate old ideas and limitations. As the Zen Buddhists say, only an empty bowl can be filled. Alchemists described this principle through the maxim, no generation without corruption, an idea similar to the Wiccan to rise you must fall. New growth cannot take place until the old is cleared away. The Negredo then fermented until at length the Cauda Pavonis occurred. 
This was portrayed as a light show of many colors. This means that when we have purified ourselves of old ideas, we may then experience many new ideas, and indeed will at first run riot with them, learning all we can from all sources. During this period we may in fact be bedazzled or blinded by the newfound light, but through the application of self-control we can learn to discern what is helpful to our growth and what is merely entertaining. After the Kauta Pavonis, the subject must be purified, resulting in the albedo. The albedo is a pure and receptive spiritual state. This means that after initial euphoria, a more controlled spiritual growth may unfold, elevating and expanding the consciousness. Finally, after being subjected to pressure again, the albedo becomes activated as the rubedo. What this means is that spiritual knowledge, to be valuable, must be put into practice. No matter how deep the ideas, or how great the abilities, they mean nothing if they are, as Mabel Hykerel once put it, left on a shelf to gather dust. Thus old ideas must first be transcended. Then controlled spiritual growth can lead to spiritual enlightenment, which must be put into practice to be of value. This is, of course, an oversimplification, in that it is the opposite of the alchemist's own tendency, which was to overcomplication. Like the ceremonials, alchemists phrased their writings in intentionally obscure wording, ostensibly to shield their teachings from those they considered unworthy. It also served to shield themselves from persecution by religious fanatics. Alchemists used a rich symbology that included elemental, planetary, and mineral symbolism, as well as a good dose of ancient paganism. One of the principal themes of alchemical symbolism is the union of opposites, which is expressed in many ways throughout alchemical art. Such familiar figures as the four elements, the twin dragons, and the Ouroboros, the great serpent of the universe eating its own tail, were of great importance in alchemy. The masculine principle was likened to the sun and also to sulfur, while the feminine was considered lunar and likened to mercury. The inner fire, what we today call the eternal flame or the divine spark, was described as a salt. It is this mineral symbolism above all which has led to the idea that alchemy was entirely concerned with protochemistry operations. True, alchemists did engage in such protochemistry operations in the belief that it would shed light on their spiritual operations under the credo, as above, so below, which is a principal pillar of alchemical thought, as of modern Wiccan thought. However, it was a dilettante alchemist who misunderstood the spiritual nature of the teachings and turned instead to chemical operations, not realizing that they were a code for higher knowledge. It is not possible, of course, to do a more thorough examination of alchemical thought and symbolism in this format. But hopefully, this brief discussion will be enough to give an indication of its nature and content, as well as the extent to which it is misunderstood. This has been the Interactive Grimoire. Thank you, and have a good night.